would say that the major goal of learning as a violinist is to automatically react, to automatically perform what we have practiced for many, many hours. To do this, we need to learn about and acquire the necessary motor skills needed to perform the music we have decided to learn. Fitz and Posner, in their book called Human Performance, suggest that motor skill acquisition follows three stages or phases. Cognitive, associative, and autonomous. In my effort to connect this information to our learning process as violinists, we first need to define, if we're going to understand this, just what a skill is. Well, I guess you could say that a skill is having the ability to bring about an end result or performance with the maximum amount of certainty and the minimum amount of energy. How do violinists develop the capability to perform skills like this automatically? Well, simply put through practice and lots of it. Because of this, one should not expect to perform in this manner quickly. Practicing for the kind of automaticity which one sees in this kind of performance generally occurs when the performance is related to the way in which one practices. In other words, how we learn it will determine how we perform it. Have a look at this chart. It's through encoding or practicing in the short-term or working memory to our long-term memory that is critical, as this will determine how easily we can retrieve what we have learned. It's with this in mind that I propose we explore these three phases and see just how they connect to our practice and performance outcomes. The first phase, or cognitive phase, is about the development of an overall understanding of the skill, an overall understanding of the work, an overall understanding of the composer. Here we determine what the objective of those skills are, what the objective of the composer was, and begin to process the factors that will affect our ability to produce the work. Second is the associative phase, which begins motor skill development. One could say it's the how to do it phase. Here we refine those observed skills to a deep level of understanding. And finally, we have the autonomous phase, which is where we make those learned skills automatic through repetitive practicing and other tools. With this in mind, let's start so I can show you in detail what I mean. So let's begin with phase one or the what to do phase. So I guess exploring what to do would entail getting a full context about the composer, the work, etc. So developing this context would occur before we actually begin to learn the notes, the rhythms, etc. Let's suppose that we're starting to learn the violin concerto number two in D minor, opus 22, by the Polish violin virtuoso composer Wieniawski. Here, let me play the first theme of the first movement for you.
first of all, we need to learn about Danyavsky, where he was born and lived, how he lived, who his friends were, what life was like, where he lived, you know, etc. And, and of course, we need to get a good, clean copy of the music, say from virtual sheet music or other online vendors like Amazon. Then we would want to find out what we could about how the work came into being. What were the motivating factors behind the creation of the work? As you can see, using your computer, pad, or phone could be a great tool. Then we should listen and listen and listen as we need to understand as many different performance perspectives as we can. So YouTube, or any other online music sharing service becomes a vital tool in this process. Of course, you can purchase a CD as well through Archive Music or Amazon or other online music stores. And obviously, we should know all about every indication in the score. For example, here at Smart Allegro con Fuoco, so Wikipedia can be quite useful. Or simply use your browser's location bar to, to push you, to guide you in the right direction. In my lessons with Ms. Delay, she asked us to bring the full orchestral score to lessons, so I bought pocket scores. But now you have the resource IMSLP. Use it to get that full orchestral version that full orchestral score, so that when you are listening to this work, you have that full score in hand. All of these resources will give us, will help us clarify in our minds how we will envision this piece to be performed. But let's not forget our ultimate goal, that being to turn these images, these definitions, these thoughts, all of these things, we need to turn them into physical realities. As it's through t the touching of the violin and the touching of the bow that we create our performance, manifest our opinion about the work, present our emotions about the work to the public, show the public what we believe to be true about the work we are performing, for them. So in phase two, we would begin to explore, to refine our movement. It's here that we begin to understand, to uncover the motor skills necessary to obtain the highest performance proficiency we can achieve. For the record, it's at this point that I cease to listen to all recordings, as my goal is not to copy someone else's performance but to establish parameters. It is now that we need to be able to play the piece in tempo, so as to be able to ascertain what things feel like, what works, and what does not, so that we can prioritize our later practice. To do this, we need to carefully take the time to make sure that we know all the notes, all the fingerings, all the rhythms, and all the bowings. But what exactly do I mean when I say we must know these things? What exactly is knowing? How deeply do I need to go to know something? Well, what I don't mean is that we must know how to play all the notes in tune or cleanly. This is not a part of the process that I'm proposing. What I mean by knowing is that you've looked at every single note and played every single note so that you know you're playing all the notes. That you've figured out the fingerings for these notes. That you've looked at every single rhythm and bowing so that you know them all to be true. Again, does this mean that you need to play every note fingering, rhythm, and bowing up to tempo, in tune, and cleanly? Absolutely not. But you must know them. 
That said, this part of the learning process should take as few days as possible. So let's look at this passage from the first movement of Inyavsky's Concerto in D minor, and I'll show you what I mean. Now that we've done this, we need to develop a way to understand the patterns, the symmetry found in this music, found in this passage. As the majority of the music we play is tonal, the use of scales are clearly a part of the journey towards our understanding of this music. It's with this in mind that I use tetrachords to map my way through the music with my left hand. To do this, I treat the violin as if it were a diagrammed fingerboard, like this. Here I can visually imagine my tetrachords and use this to design pathways that will increase my efficiency and effectiveness. For the right hand, I use spatial designs like figure eights to understand the movements in my right hand. You see, we can go this way or that way. I even like to use spheres. I can go this way or that way, but I can also go this way. I like the spheres. So it's in this way that I can take the notes, the fingerings, the rhythms, and the bowings, and turn them into something that I can intellectually understand, that I can visually represent. So looking again at that passage, this means that I need to find the notes, find the fingerings, since there is no rhythmic issue, be sure about bowings, and begin to explore string changes, string crossings. Once I've achieved this intellectual understanding, I need to turn it into a physical understanding or specific sensory motor actions. To do this, I need to become extremely aware of the points in my body that are used to create these actions. Have a look at this design that I made, which points out some of the areas that we need to be aware of. Shoulder, biceps, elbow, forearm, wrist, thumb, fingers. In becoming aware of or increasing our sensitivity to these areas of the body, we are beginning the process of turning something that is intellectual in nature into a sensory motor action or physical activity. It is this physical activity that we are going to remember as it is in this phase that the memory process has truly begun to happen. Now let's look again at that Vinyavsky excerpt. You see, we can create games or strategies like play the first three notes, then add one. Play five notes, then start at the second note and play the next five notes.
start at the third note and play the next five notes. Etc. Try getting to 10 and counting one for each correct time you've performed it. But minus two for every time that you missed it. Or you can make a metronome sheet. You decide on a tempo and then proceed by two till you arrive at the goal or can't go any further. You can push closer to your goal from day to day. And as Ms. DeLay said, if you wish to get to a certain tempo, if you're trying to get to a certain tempo, be sure you go above it. Let's say if it were at 90, be sure you can do 100 or even 110. This vertical training stretched over days is a clean method towards achieving your goals. But you must, of course, already physically understand how to do it. So in this example, we want a crescendo. So we should consider how many ways we can create this crescendo. Let's see. With the right hand, pressure or weight, point of contact, With the left hand, finger pressure. And as many as you can create, you know, be creative. Oh, yes, perhaps it would be useful to understand that to make sound, which will make that crescendo, to make sound, it's about pressure or weight, speed, and point of contact. So with these ideas, one can create, one can push towards the goal of putting this information into our long-term memory, and very importantly, being able to retrieve it. Doing this allows us to create a path towards the very highest level of performance. During the last phase, Phase three, we now train ourselves to respond and not think. We train ourselves to look and automatically react. We train ourselves to make what we have learned second nature. It's here that we prepare ourselves to enter the zone, you know, but what athletes call the zone. Most of this is done through repetitive practicing. I mean, isn't this why? Isn't this the only reason we play something over and over and over again? Isn't this the goal? Aren't we trying to make those physical gestures that we have now become aware of automatic? You see, when we rehearse or practice, all of the information we, we gather through our sensitivity, our awareness, makes it much easier to use the tools like the metronome or other practicing strategies I've mentioned before. We can do this because the process has become clearer, because we have developed a clean and clear methodology, a clearer understanding of physically what we are trying to accomplish, what we are trying to achieve, where we are trying to go. So let's take a final look at the Vinyavsky Concerto. Using what we have learned provides us with a few ways to accomplish the state of mind. Let's look at the second movement of the Vinyavsky. Dividing the movement up into sections like this can be very helpful. This, in effect, helps to make us work in larger chunks. Now, all of this work is from memory, glancing at the music when necessary. Now, when working on larger chunks, we can 
use what I call a recapitulation sheet. It's good for chunking, good for memorizing. Obviously, we are well on our way towards the performance from memory, the complete work or work being studied. So perhaps now would be a good time to talk about goal setting. Goals should be set for each work studied and when necessary, changed to be more realistic or more challenging. Daily goals should depend on what you need to do at that time to reach your performance goals and should also be set for each practicing day. Using a daily training log or having your schedule organized in a notebook or using a, a notepad on your computer will help in assuring that you will develop these productive habits. Careful though, as we sometimes make the mistake of only setting outcome goals and then forget to set process goals. Outcome goals tend to focus on your place or your results in a performance or competition. Process goals focus more on what we need to do, and so they help you to find specific things to focus on. To be sure you are setting process goals, ask yourself, how will I accomplish that? How can I do that? What do I need to do to make that happen? Goal setting helps us to develop a planned and specific way of incorporating the skills we have acquired into practice and performance. Goal setting increases focus, motivation, direction, feelings of success, and self-confidence. Here, here's a small list that I've made concerning goals. One, make challenging but realistic goals. Two, be specific in describing your goals. Three, make clear commitments to reaching your goals. Four, goals should be written down. Five, as goals are a part of a process, reevaluate your goals periodically. So now I'm sure you can see that it is through understanding these three phases of learning, you know, cognitive, associative, and autonomous, that we develop the skills and strategies necessary to helping us become excellent violinists, excellent performers, excellent musicians. See you next time.